Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is Oros by Lucky Duck Games and AESC Games. This is a one to four player game that takes roughly 30 minutes per player and is for ages 14 and up. And in the game Oros, you are going to be basically playing as a demigod, taking your followers and placing them down onto different locations, uh, mainly sacred states of study, uh, utilizing those places to gain wisdom and of course ascend your character's demigod. All along the time, you're going to be using volcanoes to explode and create more land, changing the landscape to thusly allow you to create mountains, which you can then once again create places of study to study and gain knowledge. At the end of the game, all that matters is having the most knowledge, the most power in the game, and being the most unique and powerful mysterious demigod that there is. We'll take a look at how to set the game up, we'll take a look at how to play, and then of course my review. First things first, to note, depending on the number of players will determine whether or not you're having to play with an automata. In this game, it's not just one player, but also two players that you'll need an automata for. However, if you would like and you're playing a three player game, you can also include an automata. And you can include automatas if you're playing one player by including all three of them. Each character mat is going to have an automata system. Each automata system will have their own deck, as well as all of their own cards and tokens that you'll be using to kind of place down onto the map. In this case, I am playing a two-player game. Thusly, I have two player boards set up. I have one automata system, which is the green player over here. And then I've also set the game up for the smaller variant. This can be played between one to four players. However, if I wanted to play a larger game, I could go ahead and flip this board over and thusly play a higher player count game if I'd like, which takes a little longer. And not only with the setup but um, that you'll need to know about the automata systems, but you'll also need to know about the fact that you can kind of create different boards in the game. There are advanced game variants based on the setup. So these are a bunch of the different types of games that you can set up if you'd like. As well as, of course, noting that everything has a backside to kind of increase the game's complexity and length. In this mode, however, I'm doing the base setup for the game, the most simplistic version for the game, as well as, of course, the, most sh the shortest mode of the game as well. So we'll go ahead and get into all that now. Just I just need to let you guys know how, how this specifically is going to work. But there are multiple different variants. Okay, for the setup for the main game board, the first thing you'll do is you'll place an island on each of the red spaces on the map. There are four of them. They're going to have this little red border area. And islands are represented by a one with an outlined yellow, uh, white circle. All the rest of them are going to have a full white circle filled in with a number. So it'll be island, a one connected to a three. An island, a one connected to a three, which will go all the way along the border. There will be twos that are set on the outsides of the square. And then right in the middle is going to be a landmass with twos on the edges, and then in the borders will be threes, and right in the middle will be a four. Finally, go ahead and take your little volcanoes here and put a two volcano on each of the island spaces. Then you're gonna have your ascension track. Based on the number of players, plus if you'd like the automata. Automata, you can kind of do a whole lot of things, which we'll talk about in my review, but for this case, you'll go ahead and simply place your two player tokens along with the automata token right down below at the very bottom below the scoring track, as well as all of the different volcanoes. There are ones, twos, threes, and four volcanoes. On the left hand side of the game mat, you're also going to have all the different tiles, and make sure that you set them up in the different marker orders that they have. So a full mountain, a four, a three, a two, and a one that connects, and then a one that doesn't, which is an island. There are your automata decks, which you will not need if you do not have to use them. You're going to have your score marker, and any tokens for any number of players that you're not playing the game with, which is typically just going to be one, because you're always going to have at least one automata when playing with two players. So really, it's only not going to be needed when you're playing a single player game. Then you might throw away one of those and just play with the two. So. The game player boards. Basically, you're going to set aside your player boards and put them face up, which are going to have the demigods on them. The automata system will actually just have the name of the automata and the type of automata it is. I'm playing with the competitive green version. However, if you would like, you could go ahead and play with a different board, which will be less competitive or more competitive, depending on what you choose. Each player is going to get these sacred sites. There are three of them. You have monoliths, shrines, and temples. Set them aside next to your game board. You'll have these little markers as well. They kind of look like little arrows. There are going to be six of them. Some of them are numbered and some of them are not. Go ahead and place them aside. You can choose to use them or not. They're kind of like reminder tokens. Then you'll have your followers. Three are gonna go on your board on the follower spaces on the left-hand side. Three of them will go right off of your board. 
and two of them are going to go on your journey followers and build one sacred site spaces. Finally, you're going to have these little ascension trackers, these little markers that ascend up your board. Go ahead and place them all down the bottom dotted line. There should be a total of five for the filled in circle, uh, squares and three for the ones that are based on the monolith shrines and temples, but it's pretty easy. Just place them all down right in a horizontal row. After that, you're pretty much ready to go. You can go ahead and take aside, take aside any decks that you're not using for the Tamata system, any markers you're not utilizing, and if you're not utilizing the hint tokens, you can move those away as well. And you're ready to go and start Oros. So let's explain how to play the game. So playing the game Oros is quite simple actually, but there are quite a few actions. But the first thing you'll do just before you start is make sure that you give one player the green monkey, and that will be the first player of the game. Another thing that's kind of unique about this game is the first turn you'll be taking is going to be a little different than all the other turns. You're gonna have three of your followers off of the game board, and these are the ones you're gonna to use to start your first turn. The first one you're going to place is going to be on any island space that is not occupied. You can choose any space on the board and you can place that follower. After that, you'll take your two actions, and you'll be taking your two actions by placing them one at a time on one of your white spaces on the bottom of your player board. There are six different locations that you can place these guys on, and only one may fill up each of them, no matter the size. I can place one on a shift tile, and I would perform that action. I would then take another one and put it on the erupt to form, um, to form volcanoes, or erupt or form volcanoes, in which case I would take my, that'd be my third action, and I would pass. And the next player would go as well. They would take one of their followers and place it on an unoccupied island. Then they would take each of their characters one at a time, placing them on the different locations on the game board and taking those actions. And then from there, the rest of the game is actually quite simple. You will be moving your characters from an occupied space to an unoccupied space. And you can do that three times, meaning you'll get three actions. I'll move one character over here, I'll move another character over here, I'll move another character over here, and I pass. And the next player will go and move one character over here, one character over here, one character over here, and they will pass. Another thing to note too is you have the automata, right? So after I take my first actions in the game, she takes her next actions in the game, it'll come to this character here. And automata systems work like this. You will take one card from their deck and reveal it onto the table. You will perform one action on the top of this card here, and they will have a variety of actions because some of them you will not be able to do. Then you'll perform whatever action is involving the movement of the board here, and finally, you'll gain victory points or ascension points with the bottom marker here by moving the character up onto the track that many spaces. And then it would just go back to this player here. Once again, moving their spaces. One, two, three, one, two, three. And finally, once again, drawing a card and doing what it says, one, 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 and ending and continuing the game like that, moving any pieces that that character might move. So now you know how the game is going to flow, but you have no idea what all the actions are. So let's get into them. The first action in the game is going to be called shift all tiles in a row. So if I have a, war, a, a follower here and I move it to the first area, shifting tiles, I'm going to be able to shift all of them. Now, this board is kind of a unique little board here. When you shift things, depending on where you shift them, they will go across the board. So for instance, I want to move this row here and I could, go, I could then go ahead and shift it across. Now in this case here, these would all shift and you'd follow the row um, all the way like this. So these guys would move over here, these guys would move over here, these would move over here, and it's just gonna kind of move in a clockwise rotation. So when these guys go here, they push the other ones, and then these ones push these ones, and now all of a sudden, the board looks a little different, and the characters are in different spaces. And that's kind of the funky one. In general though, whenever you want to shift all tiles in a row, let's say you want to shift all these tiles, you'll actually move all of these one, and this one here will move one, and it will slide over here. That's one way to do it. Another one could be, I could move all these tiles down here, this one will move up one, and uh, this one will move up one just like that. So that's how you shift all tiles in a row. Now, there's a couple of unique things about this as well. As the game progresses, and I'll explain this later, but as the game progresses, this marker will move up, and based on where it's at, you'll have bonuses. You could move them all one time, then two, uh, then three, and then you can move mountains, and then you gain victory points. The next one. If you choose to do so, you can move a tile set on one space. To start, you'll be having to move a set of three tile sets. 
meaning that uh, you have to choose three tiles connected to each other and then you can move them. And when you move them, you'll put them on top of other tiles. They're kind of gonna combine tiles. So in this case here, if I want to move all these guys here, I can move them all just like that. And now I have a four and a two. This two is going to collide into this one here. It's going to go back to the area and I am going to be able to select a two volcano and put it on here. So now this is a total of six. And anything else that you connect, we'll just add on to it. A one will go to a two, a two will go to a three, and a four will go to nothing. <laughs> because once a four is made, that's pretty much it, and you'll start going to volcanoes. Um, and whenever you have two fours that connect, collide together, that will create these bad boys. These are mountains, which are hard to move. And that's pretty much how the tiles are going to move. However, if you upgrade this, you'll start being able to just move two tile sets and eventually you'll be able to move a one tile set. And instead of just going up, down, left or right, you can go in diagonal ways and so on and so forth. And it improves from there. Erupt or form a volcano. Well, I could choose either to erupt one volcano or I can form a little three volcano. You can choose any locations that you want, place one down. So that's one thing you could do. Um, but let's just say I am going to place a volcano. So bam, I'll place that there. Okay, and let's say my next turn, I want to erupt a volcano again, and I'm able to do that. I would choose this one here, erupt this, and now I've got a volcano in this little middle space here. And I can choose any of the directions that I want to go in. So if I chose to move it from here to here, so the volcano er er erupted, and I've got three value. Value one is creating a one space here. And then let's say I wanted to go uh, over here. I could then go, okay, value two. Let's say I wanted to go this way. Well, because there's water on this space here, I need to fill that in with a volcano before I can move over here. So the final value would be to turn this one into a four. And that's pretty much how it works. The only rule specifically is that when you erupt a volcano, you're gonna be moving it from one to the next, to the next, to the next. Only continue on the same space if there's water. Otherwise, you're gonna to progress to the next area. And based on the number of little volcanoes is how many you're gonna be able to do that. And they're always gonna spread outward. And that's pretty much how volcanoes work. Um, as you improve this, you're going to be able to erupt more and more and more volcanoes. The next action is I can go ahead and send or return to, uh, from study. So what, what that means is uh, basically you're going to be taking your characters out to gain knowledge. You can take them out from your board here and you can place them either on your study location on your board and there is a two spot in the top right hand corner or I could take a character from my board and place it on a site of worship. One of these areas here it could be a monolith or a shrine or a temple. Now I know you don't know what this is. I kind of just added this here. I'll explain that how that works later. Just know that when I choose to push out to go study, I will send them from here and place them on one of the sites I have, or I'll send them from here and place them on here. It's also worth noting if your board ever fills up and you can't do anything because all your spaces are filled up, your only action is to send to study onto your board over here. You can see, or, or you can send, yeah, you can send to study over here and thusly it'll open spaces up on your board. And the other thing too is you can return from study. When you return from study, we'll just go ahead and say that I have one worker or one follower over here and one over here, both spaces of study because they're on their like sacred location. They're at their location that's sacred on their player board. I can return these guys, putting them onto my board and I will gain wisdom, one wisdom for each follower that I remove. And wisdom is going to allow me to push these markers up on my board. I can increase their value. And there's a bunch of different types of values, which I've been explaining throughout the game. Um, as far as like how the eruptions go, I can form additional eruptions. I can move certain numbers of tiles. I can shift a number of times. And then on this side with the monolith shrines and temples, I can increase their value on the board here uh, based on how much I increase this, as well as your potential wisdom that you gain while moving this up as well. And that's basically how your sending and returning works. The other thing to note too is you can never have more than one follower on the board until you actually increase the follower level on this little send or return from study track up by one, in which case you'll have to put an equal or less than amount of three. And then eventually it will be an infinite number of followers that you can have out. So that's how you can kind of increase that track there. The next action is the journey followers. It's actually quite simple. 
you can move a follower one space whenever you do so. You'll take your character and move it one space on the board. Typically speaking, you're going to have to move from landmass to landmass, and you can move from one space to another. And every single tile counts as a space, except whenever you're going to have these different sacred spaces on here. So if there is a monolith here, and there is also a shrine here, and then there is also a temple here, Whenever you want to move up this mountain for whatever reason, it will cost you one per space that you move up. So if I am over here on this four spot and I want to move up here, it will cost me one, two, three, four actions or four movement spaces, I should say. And you can also increase the value based on wisdom to move characters up to three spaces. Then you can move over water and so on and so forth. It can get pretty, pretty powerful. In fact, it can go up to five spaces if you get all the way to the top. And the last action. The last action is you can build one sacred site. To build a sacred site, it's pretty simple. You have to A, we'll just go ahead and do it, use an example with this guy here. You have to A, have a character on the mountain, on an unoccupied space, uh, and you also have to have a space available where you can place a temple, shrine, or monolith. So if I have my character here, I don't already have a temple, shrine, or monolith there, I can then go ahead and build one sacred site. I can place this here and then I can move the character on that mountain space up in which I can now study. Additionally, whenever I do build one of these three specific types of uh, sacred sites, I am going to gain ascension. I will gain two ascension and I will also gain wisdom based on what I built. And in this case, I built a temple, thusly I would gain three wisdom. And I could just go ahead and move three on the tracks here. And those are pretty much all the main actions in the game. There's a few other things worth noting, and I'm probably not going to cover exactly everything, but when you move all of these five up one space, uh, the shifting, the moving a tile, erupting, sending or returning, and journeyed followers, when they all go up one here, I will unlock additional characters. So typically there are going to be three characters, three followers that are locked on this side of the game board. When they move up, I'll take this one and I can place it down. I can either place it on a place to study, I can place it down on one of my actions and gain a bonus action, and thusly have an extra follower that I can use throughout the game. Um, another thing to note is when you're moving up this ascension track, if it says to ascend two, for instance, and I'm at the bottom here, I am going to skip each of the player spaces and only count the spaces that are empty. So I would go one and two, and this can involve you jumping players quite a number of spaces throughout the game. And of course, the other thing, which is kind of cool as well, is you're going to have these little markers here, which might not seem very useful, but in fact they are. These will allow you to plan out the game and your turn as you'd like to take your actions. So that way when you take a piece off, you'll remember where that piece originally was when you choose to try and place it on a new space. So if you don't like the space, after all, when it comes down to your turn, you can go ahead and switch it up, keeping these tokens as wonderful little reminders. Always note, too, whenever you explode from an island, an island doesn't have any land masses around it. Thusly, you're not able to move off of an island, but you can erupt an island. And when you do, you're actually going to turn a one space with a white outline circle into a white space one with a filled in circle, thusly allowing you to connect to a new location on the map. Now always make sure that when you choose which direction, that is how it's going to connect. So if I have this island here and I want to connect to this landmass, I obviously am going to blow up the volcano that's on it, and we'll just say that there's a three on it, and I'm going to be able to take this guy and place it here. And then now I have the ability to move any followers that maybe I might have on the space to the space that it now uh, connects to because the, the, the volcano kind of produced land that allows me to move through it. Another cool aspect of the game is, let's just say I move these two with one of my actions. Whenever this island space doesn't have an island, there's kind of like this internal ground fissure that always erupts and allows for a new island to be made. So land is always going to be created even while moving pieces around the game board. And that's pretty much it. It's just going to continue the game like that, going from this player taking or moving three dudes around, this player moving three dudes around, Automata draws a card and you do what it says, and then you're gonna go ahead and go back and check to see how Ascension is going to be moving around the game board. People are gonna be slowly heading up the track here until somebody hits the top. Once somebody hits the top here, that's going to trigger end game. 
everybody will get equal number of turns. So if it's the first player that does that, everybody will get one more turn. If it's the last player, the game will end. And you'll score points. And there's a variety of ways you're going to be scoring points. And you can check this little tracker here, this little notebook here, but I can just explain it to you pretty easily. All of your monoliths, shrines, and temples on the mat here are going to be worth whatever their value is based on how much you pushed these up. You're also going to score points based on your upgraded spaces, the five here. There are four of them that specifically give you either three or seven victory points. And uh, you can also uh, gain victory points when moving this track up. And when you do that, as far as it goes up, you're going to check the lowest row above, uh, below this, this row that you have, and you'll score either one, two, or three points for every one of your followers who is either stutter, studying on your area, on your game board, or on one of the sacred sites on the game mat. There you go. That's Oros. I hope I explained it well enough for you. So I know there are a few extra little things I didn't cover in the game. And as, as we go through my review, maybe I'll remember things. Like, for instance, the one thing is there is a 5 and a 10 space on this ascension track, which will allow you to place a volcanoes on the board when you hit it. And only for the first player who hits it, that's what, that's what will trigger that. Um, you know that there are going to be upgrades for all of your abilities as you move up with wisdom on this track here. And all of these are going to provide you with bonus points as well and additional wisdom when you build them provided you've increased the knowledge or wisdom on these tracks, uh, thus allowing you to gain additional wisdom for your monoliths, shrines, and temples. And I think I mentioned this as well, but it's really important to note, you may never build a sacred site on a mountain in which you already have one sacred site. It doesn't matter if it's a monolith shrine or a temple already there. And if you want to place a character down on a sacred site, you have to make sure that it is empty and that it is yours when you choose to go study, which means you're gonna have to move your characters off of these spaces. But if you do so, there's penalties potentially at the end of the game. So you have to be very careful when you choose to do so. Oros is, like I said, a Euro game it's an abstract game, and it's a puzzle game. And there's a lot of options in the game. While there is only six main actions, all of the, um, all of the actions are going to be customizable, except for the build a sacred site, thusly making it easier for you to manipulate the game board. You are going to be doing things like shifting rows, allowing you to kind of move characters around in certain areas. And there are rules attached to that as well, whether you can actually shift a row of a mountain, um, which you, you can't, you can't move mountains there. Once they're built, that's it. Um, you're able to then place land masses together by moving a tile set, attaching them being, I could choose three of these guys, I could then move them on top of each other, uh, thusly creating new types of land masses and returning others and uh, being able to kind of create these four slots. So that way you can create a mountain when you attach two fours together. And so your, your board is gonna constantly change just by moving tile sets. And like I said, yeah, if you have two fours together and you manage to combine them in some way, basically when you do that, these will go away and bam, now you've got a mountain, which is how you need to build sacred sites. That'll allow you to then move, find a way to move your workers here. You'll have to find a way to like create land masses to thusly get your worker onto the space and thusly let you build shrines, let you place your workers instantly on them to study, gaining ascension, gaining wisdom, and keeping track of all that can be a little bit complex. The game's actually fairly long as well. It's not my normal lucky duck I'm used to where the games are pretty quick and pretty simple. This one's actually got a, a bit more a bit more bite to it, a bit more teeth. There's a, a lot more that you can do. There's a lot more that you have to take into account. And of course, because you're playing with multiple players and automata most of the time with a two player game or a one player game, the, the Tom Talk kind of cheats. It's just able to do stuff. It'll be like, if there's a thing here, you just do it. Um, or just add a thing to the map, you know, and, and that will change the game and it'll change your plans. So you can't really predict what this player can do, but you can kind of end up have an idea of what most of your characters will do. So. Uh, my preference for this game is playing with the three or four players because then I have a little bit more control or knowledge uh, So I feel like I have a little more control over my next actions because in general Yes, the more players in the game the more changes to the board, but at least I know Typically what the other players are going to try to do whereas with less players there's less worry about that, but I also have the automata, which does some unique things that I cannot be ready for. I'm never going to be ready for. I'm never going to know if they're just going to add a mountain to the game board or something like that. 
The customization of this game is excellent as well, being able to choose to move land masses, to shift things, the ability to shift all the way around the circle is kind of cool and make my followers kind of move around this, this board here and kind of connect them. Like, how the heck am I gonna make this character go here? And the answer is, oh, I have actually two different ways I can do that, or three. I can either build a path there, I can rotate myself there, or I can literally move myself there with the uh, move a tile set one space. And so I have this kind of complexity that I can kind of manipulate to my advantage. Um, the game can be uh, a little bit of a, I know what I kind of need to do. So if I'm on a specific play set and I'm like, okay, I, I, I need to place, well, this is not even a blue character. This is not a blue character. That's it. Okay, it would be, it'd be this space there. But if I know that I want to, build shrines. That's like the big thing. Shrines, monoliths, temples. I want to build these sites. They're going to give me ascension points. It'll get me to ending the game. It'll get me to gaining wisdom, which will push my board up to score me more points at end game. Typically, my best, uh, my best objective is to either A, look for a close mountain and build a site, or B, I need to form a mountain by having two forests collide and thusly build a sacred site. Because this game is all about studying, it's all about, all about gaining wisdom, and it's all about ascending your, your demigod to the pinnacle of this, like, ziggurat. And so the, the complexity is there, but it's also pretty straightforward as to usually what you want to do. You kind of know what you want to do. It's whether you can manipulate it and how you can manipulate it with the puzzle that it has been given. The quality of the game. This game here is wonderful. The board is high quality. All the tilers are nice. You're able to see what is connected with what, even though they're a little bit separated. You'll know, okay, this three, well, I know it has three sides on it. I know this is the water side, and thus it connects with these two. And mountains and forest spaces are just simply straight land masses. And you always kind of, um, know what you want to do and it's all about kind of how you can do it. And this board helps you solve that by just how easy it is to tell what everything is connected to and how it goes. The Ascension Board is a great way to utilize your ability to end the game. You can start ending the game by just simply building these sacred sites as quickly as possible, getting to the point where you get these plus ones to kind of give a little edge to uh, just jump ahead. You can manipulate the board as well. If you're, if you're always in back and you're not able to be building these things, you can just go ahead and gain that one point and jump over every player. Or you can wait and let everybody kind of go ahead of you and then you can move those two spaces and now you've scored three or even possibly four points for doing so. Um, the artwork, like I said, in the game is wonderful. All the components work great. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have a lot to say negative about the quality and the style of the game. This is definitely gonna be a bit more of a brain burner, a little bit more of a thinker, and you might always be able to do what you want to do when you want to do it. Uh, sometimes you're gonna have spaces that are gonna be blocked off and you have to really think ahead. You have to know what I want to do and also what space I want to unlock to use next time, whether it be next turn or as my next action. Even taking these bonus actions when you unlock these guys here is gonna be very relevant whether you want to place them on the board or not. What spaces you choose to unlock is important too because without having an upgrade to allow you to have three characters on this board here, you're going to be only limited to one but maybe you need something else. Like maybe you need to move two spaces and you have to kind of debate and decide on which one of those actions that you're going to increase is better. I'm not a huge fan of the Tomata system, really. It's a little bit too random for me. It doesn't really, I don't really know what to expect from it. And so realistically, I just prefer to throw it out. And I think the only way to do that is to play three or four players. Um, and playing with more players in games like this in general is just more fun. So yeah, this is one of those things I recommended a three or four player experience. It does a decent job of changing the game board up and you have a little bit of a competitive aspect to having to deal with them. You can also choose not to deal with them. There's a ton of variability in the game. Do you want to play with the front side or the back side? A shorter or a longer game? You want to play with a simple setup or one of the many, many variations? Are we scoring points with these guys? Are we trying to go for achievements? Because in the back of the book, there is a ton of achievements that you can gain as you go throughout it. And of course, there's a ton of Harada. There's a ton of FAQs involved as to like forming a mountain and building multiple sacred sites, when you can place, when you can't, how you can gain bonus points whenever somebody builds a sacred site on your mountain. Let's say this guy was here. Uh, they can gain, uh, you can gain an extra point as long as your character is there, otherwise you won't. So there's kind of a catch-up mechanic for not being able to build the highest, but you'll still have to leave your cat guy there. And there's a negative advantage to building the highest space because at the highest space, 
your character is not really technically stuck there, but might take a while to have to get down off of the mountain, and especially because you can't stay in the same space as another follower. But overall, Oros is a lot of fun. It's vivid, it's beautiful, high quality components, it's thinky, it's got a little bit of a euro, a little bit of abstract strategy, and a little bit of a puzzle nature all tied in together. Once you understand all of the actions, you're going to have a good time playing the game. I strongly recommend you for the first couple games to use these markers because I got quite confused while trying to remember, okay, I don't actually want to do this action, I want to do a different one. Wait, where was the sky last located? Use these, it will be of great benefit for you to do so. And overall, just a lot of fun. It's one of those games where after you're finished playing with it, you're gonna to want to play again to see how you can do better and to know in certain areas why you didn't do as well as you did. And that's always leading for a great game. So, should you take a look at Oros? Yes, I strongly suggest you take a look at this game. And my recommendation is play three or at best four players. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Oros Go Down and Ascend. If you're looking to buy this game, there's a link down below in the description. You can also go and check out our website on filteredgamer.com, blog posts, giveaways, kicks, or lists, and more, where you can go ahead and find Twitter, you can find Instagram. We post all kinds of reviews and shorts and clips and all that. It's all available on the site, as well as, of course, here on YouTube. You can go ahead and like, comment, and subscribe. Or maybe you're on one of our other alternative platforms. We've kind of been reaching out and adding new alternative platforms. I appreciate you giving us whatever it is that they do there. Um, we'll be doing some additional content on those sites as well. All right, guys, thank you so much. And as always, I look forward to playing with you guys some Oros next time.